This is Johnny Dosco. Stay tuned for another score sheet podcast. Holy Kadelka. Welcome to another score sheet podcast. Today we're going to talk with longtime score sheet team owner Jeff Young. How you doing, Jeff? I'm doing great. How about yourself? I'm having a pretty good summer afternoon. Jeff Young, among other things, well, like I said, he's been a longtime score sheet player. He also writes a blog about the San Diego Padres called Duck Snorts. He's been doing that for many years. And he also writes a weekly column for Baseball Prospectus. Um, Jeff, I'd say that among many people, you're one of the foremost authorities on the Padres there is in the blog sphere. Uh, well, I suppose somebody's got to be. Um, yeah, I've, I've been uh, working on Duck Snorts since uh, September '97. And uh, just plugging away at it ever since. Uh, it's seen some pretty good highs uh, going from uh, the World Series in '98 uh, through the '07 season and uh, the almost excitement of last year. Yeah, last year the Padres were certainly one of the most surprising teams in baseball, I'd say. Uh, yeah, yeah, nobody really saw that coming. Uh, I'd actually was a bit mocked for picking them to finish fourth ahead of the Diamondbacks last year. A lot of people had them coming in last, so to get 90 wins out of that team was pretty, uh, it was a fun ride. Yeah, well, I think along with, you know, the Giants' higher profile winning the World Championship last year, but I think the Padres were also a real sign that pitching does, or certainly can, really win a lot of games, because I think most casual baseball fans last year would have had a hard time naming three Padre hitters. Uh, yeah, that's probably true. Um, yeah, I mean, besides Adrian Gonzalez, I don't know who else you would really point to on that team last year uh, as, as a name type of player. I guess maybe Tony Gwynn by uh, by association yeah, with by, his dad. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> if you leave the junior out of the name, yeah. But the, well, their pitching staff wasn't really big name pitchers, but they had a lot of guys that you know put out outstanding ERAs, and their bullpen just never seemed to ever give up a run. And so, much like the Giants, they just overcame a rather mediocre at best offense. Yeah, for sure. The, the bullpen was terrific. And, uh, you know, Matt Latos had a real nice uh, season in his first full year. And, uh, and he, he got some pretty good support from a couple of other guys in there. Uh, Clayton Richard, John Garland had a pretty nice season. So, yeah, all, all in all, it worked out okay. Kevin wasn't last year Kevin Correa? Was he still? Oh uh, yeah, Correa was still there. Although he he didn't pitch particularly well, but yeah, he uh, he got he actually got some really nice run support. Oddly enough. Yeah, yeah, that's something the Giant pitchers don't experience. I think I just read yesterday Matt Cain has the worst run support of any pitcher in the major leagues over the last five years. Ouch. And Tin, yeah, that's pretty bad. And Tin Lincecum, I think, has eight starts this year where the Giants did not score a run while he was in the game, which. It's pretty discouraging, I would think, as a pitcher. Wow, yeah. Yeah. But we have a ring, which, since that's the first one in my lifetime and I'm 55 years old, that's that was pretty good. Um, I imagine it would be. <laughs> so, um, what do you like best about working for BP? Well, it's it's a really good bunch of guys over there and, and, and gals and uh, a real talented uh, group of writers and people who are very... Uh, passionate about baseball and uh, committed to advancing both the analysis and of, of baseball, the sabermetric analysis of baseball, and and, uh, and the writing about baseball and, and the, just the general overall discourse. For me, I'm doing a weekly column there, basically covering the National League West throughout the season, uh, sort of focusing on a on a different story each week uh, as as the season unfolds. For me, it's been great uh, as a way to sort of keep engaged with the goings-on of other teams outside of the Padres from a week-to-week basis and kind of, you know, as every season unfolds, you, you sort of begin to see uh, narrative threads that, that sort of work throughout the entire season, and, and it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to kind of see that unfold. Um, and, of course, being able to read, I mean, I could do that without writing, but being able to read what, a, what a, our other authors are doing as well is, is always a lot of fun because there's, like I said, a lot of really talented folks there. Yeah, Baseball Prospectus has been around now for a number of years, and it seems to me they've always had a really good mix of serious numbers, but columnists who actually are also very good writers. You know, it's not just dry tables of numbers. There's a lot of really good writing, including some humor and sarcastic wit. 
Yeah, it's a real good mix of different styles, and and uh, you know, I think I think in that in that sense, it's kind of representative of baseball as a whole, where uh, there's there's a lot of different ways to appreciate the sport, and uh, I think the fact is that we all just love it so much that. Uh, you know, whatever way that manifests itself, it uh, I, I think the love for the game is what really comes through, and uh, you know, connects the writers to the readers, and, and sort of, uh, you know, at the risk of sounding a little too feel good, perhaps, just brings us all together as as fans of the sport and to celebrate uh, really what, in my mind, is not only the best sport in the world, but probably one of the best things, period, in the world. Yeah, well, I've always felt baseball is the best sport to read about. You know, everybody likes reading about their favorite teams, no matter what sport. But um, baseball is the one sport, you know, I can be pretty happy reading an article about the Houston Astros if it's read well, even though I really, the Astros don't interest me that much other than because it's baseball. Whereas in the other sports, you know, if I read an article about the, I don't know, Falcons or something like that, I, you know, if they start talking about their offensive line, I kind of lose interest after a while. But somebody that writes about Atlanta's bullpen, I can read that for an hour. Yeah, there's there's never any shortage of uh, interesting topics going on at any one moment, and uh, you know, it's the beauty of having 162 games. Uh, it's it's just one giant long soap opera, and there's always something going on that uh, that, that you either weren't expecting or or you know maybe makes you look at something in a different light so I um, mean that you know it's, it, things are always unfolding in, in new and exciting ways and, and uh, the capacity to surprise I think is is certainly the, something that draws me to like you said uh, reading about even things that on the surface you wouldn't necessarily think gee I really want to know what's going on with uh, well I was going to use Kansas City and Pittsburgh but they're kind of bad examples right now because they're well I guess they are good examples because you know, for years there hasn't been a whole lot to talk about with those teams, and now with Kansas City you've got that youth movement coming in, and with Pittsburgh up until very recently you had them coming out of nowhere to contend. So, um, and Arizona this year. So there's always something going on that's uh, that's a little bit surprising. Yeah, well, teams teams turn around. Kansas City has certainly been a trendy pick in the last year or so of people that follow the minor leagues. And a lot of people saying Kansas City in a couple of years might finally really be a serious contender. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, you know, you see them bring up all those kids that they brought up with Hosmer and, and uh, you know, Mostakis hasn't done much yet, as I know from, unfortunately, no. at least one of my score sheet teams. <laughs> um, yeah, I have him but you know, third base on one of my teams. But, you know, they're, they're, I mean, they're kind of looking, I mean, they're sort of slowly starting to follow the old Tampa Bay pattern of, hey, Let's stop going out and getting Jose Guillen and Gil Mesh and start developing and and uh, and see if we can bring a winner here. And uh, it's it's you know from an outside perspective, it's 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 fun to watch. Yeah, I think though that I've actually had some arguments with people this year about Kansas City. I really think their their young pitching is not nearly as strong as their young hitting, and it's going to disappoint some people. And I just. You know, it's just easier to get hitters if you need a hitter than it is to get pitchers. It just there aren't very many teams ever that are willing to trade really good pitching, um, unless they're in the last year of a contract. Or, well, I guess Colorado just traded Jimenez, but a lot of people don't quite understand. You know, they think maybe he's hurt and Colorado knew it or something, because those are the kind of trades people don't usually make, where you trade away a young pitcher who's had some good stats and is under your control for the next three or four years. Those are the guys usually teams hold on to, won't give up for anything. Yeah, yeah, that was that was kind of a surprising deal. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, I mean, Let's see how it goes. So, as a as an NL West expert, do you see any guys coming up in September for either of those teams or well, any team in the majors that might help a fantasy team that? Might even still be available in a in a draft this month. Oh gosh, um, immediate impact. Um, you know, not. I mean, I, Goldschmidt just came up with Arizona. He's probably still available in some leagues because he, he he just might be. Um, and, and you know, he's going to be an interesting guy because he's not going to have. He's probably not going to hit for a whole lot of batting average, but he's got those nice secondary skills, which of course uh, translate a lot better. Often to score sheet than they do to, you know, more category-based type things. You can you can live with the, uh, 
uh, low batting average if you're getting some walks and home runs out of it, which Goldschmidt certainly provides. You know, I mean, Rizzo will be back up with the Padres at some point, although I'm sure probably most people, he's probably gone in a lot of leagues, and um, I, I think he probably projects more for um, future value than for current value. But as a Padre guy, you still think Rizzo is a kind of guy you'd want to keep next year. Oh, yeah, for team, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I don't know how much value he'll provide down the stretch, but absolutely for next year and going forward. I mean, he's uh, his path at first base is pretty wide open, and I, you know, he's he's still got a pretty high ceiling in spite of his uh, home park and his initial struggles. The guy's 21 years old. Um, I don't think he's going to be a superstar, but he's going to be. A, yeah, yeah, he's going to be a solid ball player, and and uh, I, I expect him to stick around a while. Yeah, I think. I mean. There's a lot of young guys like Moustakas, who you mentioned earlier. That when you come up to the majors at 20 or 21, it's hardly unusual to have a really rough first month or so. And a lot of those guys go back down for a little while, and then when they come back, they're just as good as advertised. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you know, you look back to, I mean, I always, the classic examples are guys like Mike Schmidt or, or, um, or like A Rod when he first came up. and. You know, there's a lot of guys like that. I mean, some some players they come up and they they're right off the bat. They're you know, Albert Pujols comes to mind. But for other guys, the path isn't so linear. It's it's a little bit of, oh wow, you know, I've I've never seen that kind of pitching uh, back at AAA or AA or wherever it was, or or just getting acclimated to the, to, you know, different routines and different regimens and 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 just I mean it's the same game of course but as they as the cliche goes everything moves a little bit faster and uh, you know there's always an adjustment period or there's often an adjustment period and I think that's what we've seen with Rizzo and up there in uh, San Francisco with a guy like Brandon Belt so um, it's just it's sort of part of the growing process for a lot of guys. Though in Belt's case his second time up which just ended he actually really hit the ball pretty well. That's just more of that classic baseball problem of they're paying Aubrey Huff $10 million a year and they didn't want to tell him go take a seat on the bench because Belt actually, his second, like I said, he struggled his first time up. They sent him down for a few weeks. He came back up and had an OPS of right around 800, which this year in baseball is pretty dang good. Then they traded for Beltran and they didn't really have a place for him, so they sent him down. So, and they've got Huff for $10 million for next year also. So. Rizzo, like you said, he's at least got an opening. There's nobody playing first base at San Diego that anybody cares about, I don't think. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, Kyle Blanks is really a first baseman, but he, he's probably going to end up in left field, at least for the short term. If they, Well, I mean, there's a lot of different things the Padres could do uh, yeah. going into next year on the corners. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, they didn't trade for Rizzo to not play him, so. No, I think he'll be coming up. Absolutely. You know, yeah. Well, you mentioned on-base percentage being important in score sheet. Do you play much Rotissi or score sheet your main fantasy? I really haven't. I, I mean, I, I played. I started playing Roto in, back in 84 when the book came out, when the old green book came out, and I played it for right. several years. And, I, you know, I've done some of those free, you know, online leagues periodically, but I haven't really played any in, I, I don't know, probably three or four years. And even when I would play occasionally, I've, I've been pretty much – dedicated to score sheets since oh gosh I mean I started I started being like a silent partner on some teams in the late 80s and early 90s and I I think I finally branched out on my own in about 93 uh, or 4 and I so most of my focus has been on score sheet uh, for the last yeah good 15 years or so well that's good so you like well then you must like something about score sheet more than rush history Oh, I mean, for sure, because, you know, before I ever started playing Roto, like back in the late 70s, early 80s, I used to play some of the tabletop games, like not Stratomatic so much or, or Appa, but uh, I actually played uh, Avalon Hill Status Pro. Uh-huh, I remember that one. And so I, I always liked that kind of, um, that real sequential feel of the game where, where you're sitting down laying down cards and and you see the outcome of an actual game unfold. It's a, you know, a true simulation. And um, so when I when I was introduced to score sheet, at first it was a little bit strange to me because I was like, oh, wait, okay, so it's kind of like rotisserie because you're you're using real, you know, this year's statistics, but it's really it's really a simulation because it's you know you're not just counting numbers, you're not it's it's not accounting, it's not adding things up and, and you know 
surprise, you've got a winner or whatever. You're actually putting these guys into a lineup, making decisions, you know, choosing who to bat where, what, who to sit against lefties, um, you know, how to how to manipulate your bullpen and your pinch hitters and so forth. And to me, that was uh, that was a lot more appealing and and um, and continues to be so to this day. It's um, it's more of a it gives me more of the feeling of of an actual baseball game rather than just seeing how many points I accumulated in a given week or whatever. Yeah, the concept of points in baseball. My dad was one of those guys that was an incredible stickler for not calling runs points. You know, when you're a little kid, you you kind of go, hey, the Giants got four points today, you know, when you're seven years old. And I just remember as a little kid, my dad would just yell at us, there are no points in baseball. It's runs. You know, so when I, when I first read about Rhodes history, that was strange enough. One of the first things that came to mind was, really, points? There's no points in baseball? So well, yeah. <laughs> One of the things that sort of got me was that at, at one point, I, after I'd been playing for a few years, and I, enjoy, I certainly enjoyed Rhodes history because up to that point there was nothing like it where you had a real uh, something happening in the current season. Um, but one of the things, at some point I, I did sit down and I kind of uh, pretended that the National League was a Rhodes history league, and I, and I tallied up points for teams, and, and it just it wasn't it didn't work. I mean, it was like... You know, the, yeah. I, I, the World Series champion finished in sixth place or something like that because they they were, you know, they didn't steal bases or whatever it was. You know, whatever it was, they didn't point out well, but they were they were doing all the things that helps a real team win, like playing good defense and and they had a really nice bullpen of guys that weren't necessarily getting saves, but you know they were they were helping bridge the gap and and they were getting on base and doing all these other things. And I and I kind of thought, huh, that that's not right. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I, I, I would never slam Brits history. It was a fantastic idea, and it, you know, when I played back before we started a score sheet, it was great, because it gave you a reason to read box scores in the morning. That, um, you know, if Cleveland plays Kansas City and you're a National League Giants fan, before you had a fantasy team, you didn't read the box score, really. You might see if George Brett got a hit or something, but that was about it. So I think it was great, but... What bugged my brother the most was how valuable guys like Vince Coleman were in early Roach history, just because they stole bases. Um, oh. And go ahead. No, yeah, and a guy like Coleman could just completely disrupt your league. And he, you know, you, you kind of look back at him now, and I mean, the stolen bases were great, but I mean, there was one year he stole over 100 bases with a with an OPS below 600, which is just yeah. unreal. Yeah. Well, actually, it was the main thing that. I mean, I didn't like Vince Coleman. My brother's main thing was he's always been a huge fan of walks. You know, he was, nowadays everybody understands, I think, that on-base percentage is a much better statistic than batting average. But, you know, 30 years ago, I mean, we're both in our 50s, him and I, so 30 years ago, nobody quoted on-base percentage. It was strictly batting average, and it used to drive him nuts. And then Roach History, of course, partly because of that, I think, they didn't count walks. The only way a walk helped you was it made it a little more likely for you to get a run scored if you happen to play in a league that even counted run scored. And so he wanted a game that walks matter. And then the third thing I think we wanted was, as you mentioned, bullpens. Because if you don't get a save in Roach history, you don't get enough innings usually as a reliever to matter much. Whereas, as once again, the Padres and the Giants helped prove last year, and actually every team for the last 25 years has proven, if you don't have someone to pitch the seventh and eighth inning, it's really hard to have a winning record. Yeah, absolutely. Those guys have a tremendous amount of value, and um, uh, you know, to a, to a real big league ball club, and I and and any attempt to simulate a, a real big league experience, I, I, I think that has to be reflected in that. And and yeah, like you say, I mean, rotisserie. I mean, what's the value of a guy like Mike Adams in in, in a straight rotisserie uh, environment, and you put him in somebody like Score Sheet? I mean, I've I don't know. I think last year I closed with Adams in one of my leagues, and and he was just he was a complete shutdown guy. And it was it's like that's he wasn't a closer in the big leagues, not because he didn't have the skill set to be a closer, but because he had a guy in Heath Bell in front of him. I had the luxury of being able to employ him as my closer because, frankly, he was one of the best relievers in baseball, and and it would be foolish not to take advantage of that. So yeah, I mean absolutely something like that. And and going back to what you're saying about the walks, I. 
you know, I think back, I mean, one of my absolute favorite players growing up and, and you know, this, this sort of comes out like in, in your historical games is a guy like Gene Tennis, who absolutely was not recognized for being nearly as valuable a player as, it, as he was because he always hit around 240 because he was about the slowest yeah. guy on earth. But, you know, he'd walk 100 times a year and he'd hit 20 home runs despite playing in places where you really couldn't hit a home run. To have a guy like that or, or one of my other favorites from, you know, a little bit later than that, a guy like Dave Magadan, a guy like Magadan was completely useless in Rhodes history. But in score sheet, he, he's a terrific leadoff hitter. Yeah. Now, I remember when the Giants had Bill Mueller playing third base, and they finally traded him because he didn't hit enough home runs for a third baseman, they thought. And I just Yeah, yeah, he's a classic example. Yeah, it drove my brother and I, we just went ballistic, because his on-base percentage was great, he had great defense, and their excuse was, well, they had J.T. Snow at first, and he didn't hit many home runs, so they couldn't afford to have a third baseman that didn't hit many home runs. And I thought, well, so now you're going to get a third baseman that doesn't ever get on base. You know, how about if we get the guy back that got on base? That seemed to me to be the better idea. But, yeah, well, it'd be fun to... I mean, we're like all fantasy guys, probably, you know. It'd be great to wake up tomorrow and be the GM of our favorite Major League team. Yeah, it'd probably be more fun for us than the fans of the team, though, I imagine. But, you know. <laughs> oh, I'd do a horrible job. I mean, I, I think what a lot of people don't understand that don't think about it, but, you know, there's a lot more to being a GM than just occasionally saying... Well, will I trade Smith for Jones? You know, contracts and personalities and just a gazillion things. Yeah, well, yeah, if only it were that easy. I, I mean, I guess, yeah. Well, that's, that's why we have score sheet. <laughs> yeah, we all get to be GMs, and for the most part, we don't have to worry about contracts and all. We can, if we want to trade Smith for Jones, we just plain look at what we think Smith's going to do in the next few months or few years and what Jones is going to do. Yeah, all of the good stuff without any of the negative consequences. I, I like that. Yeah. Yeah, like, you know, owning the Dodgers right now is probably not a lot of fun. No. Or at least going bankrupt. Had to throw in a little Dodger downplay here. Sure. Yeah, I don't, you and I at least, you may be a Padre fan and I'm a Giants fan, but we can at least both agree that we do not wish the Dodgers well. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, it's been great talking to you. It's been a while since I've chatted with you. Yeah, likewise. It's uh, real good talking to you, and uh, appreciate you having me on here. Yeah, well, I'll keep reading Duck Snorts, and I'll keep seeing you in BP. And for you folks, at, what is it address they can read your Duck Snorts column at? Oh, there I'm at ducksnorts.com slash blog, and, uh, and I'm sure folks know where to find me on uh, Prospectus. Yeah, if you go to Baseball Prospectus and search for Jeff Young, by the way, it's Jeff G-E-O-F-F. You spell your name a little differently yep. than those of us other Jeffs. Um, but yeah, check out Jeff Young at Baseball Prospectus site, and, um, and check out Duck Snorts, especially if you're an NL West or a San Diego Padre fan. I think you'll really enjoy that. Well, thanks again for being on. Thank you. All right, Jeff. Bye.